in this interactive video, we're going to talk about TV, television, um, as art and a little bit of its history and evolution, something on the subject matter, the genres, and then how um, television, like cinema, both creates and reflects values. So television is considered the most widely used artistic medium in contemporary culture. And it grew out of the radio bro broadcasts of the early 1990s and developed from the traditions of drama and film. And it's been shaped by the needs of advertisers. And this is critical because it was a product of commercial culture and because the FCC and governmental agencies that oversaw its early development insisted that entertain entertainment be the main goal of television as opposed to education, right? This is um, was formative for television, like, hey, we're using this just for entertainment, not for education purposes. And so this was a decision that was made by politicians in the US. So in other words, things didn't have to go this way. It didn't have to start this way. Television could have just never been uh, used for entertainment, in other words. Um, things developed a little differently in the UK and in other nations. But now, more than 80 years after the widespread introduction of TV program, the model established by the US has become the norm. And TV was originally ignored by filmmakers because of the limitations of the medium, right? It held them back. It held, held filmmakers back. And standard deaf TV images are projected at 30 frames per second instead of 24 in order to overcome the limitations of the low resolution image itself. And the pixels in a video screen don't admit the range of contrast and level of detail and resolution that are common to the imagery of films. So a lot of early filmmakers kind of look down their noses at TV and, and that attitude persisted in the, um, in the movie industry for a really long time, like almost up to recent, recent years. But today, the use of digital projection, digital cameras has made some of those limitations less significant and TV's been more embraced by, by filmmakers, directors, editors, actors, uh, critics, and the like. Because, you know, current television screens are large enough to create home theaters. And also high def broadcast standards, they've closed the gap between TV and film to, to a major extent. So as far as the subject matter of TV is concerned, it's the moving image. That's the subject matter of TV, just like in film. And the power of the image to excite us, you know, along with its music and sound is becoming even more intense as the technology of this medium develops. Like, you know, surround sound, uh, large projection screens and LCDs, and the development of digital high def have transformed the quote unquote small box into an overwhelming and encompassing television experience that can produce almost the same kind of participation that we experience in a movie theater. So regarding commercial TV, for more than half a century in the US, a few major networks, and these were NBC, um, CBS, and ABC, and also uh, PBS, right? And Fox Entertainment, they dominated commercial television. But in the UK, the BBC was the primary source of commercial television, and similar patterns existed in other nations. But since 2000, and even before then, but especially since 2000, the spread of cable services enlarged the sources of programming, and it's begun a major shift in the habits of viewers who now have a much greater range of choices among hundreds of channels. You're not restricted to those original um, 
broadcasting companies that used to, I mean, I can remember even when I was a kid, and I'm not that old, but I remember when I was a kid when TV would go off the air, right? It was like around midnight. All of a sudden, that was the end of the broadcasting, and they'd play the national anthem, and then you get fuzz, right? Just static until it comes back on again. Such a trip to think about those days. And today, cable service is threatened by innovation because the habits of viewers are constantly changing. We all know this, right? We all know how many of our families have ditched uh, cable for other services, but we'll talk about that soon. So let's take a look at the television series um, because studying the content of early sitcoms will reveal a lot about the social structure of the family and the larger community from which and through which these series developed. Early comedies were often, they were ethnic in content, like um, the Goldbergs from 1949 to 55 portrayed a caring Jewish family in New York City. And the show ended when the family moved to the suburbs, right? And this is the still from the Goldbergs here. Um, the Life of Riley, which went from 53 to 58, starred William Bendix as, as a riveter in a comedy about an Irish working class family in Los Angeles. And this is a still from The Life of Riley. Amos and Andy went from 51 to 53, and it was set in Harlem, but got a lot of complaints about Black stereotypes and was eventually dropped by the network. But even it was popular among some Afri African Americans. And here's a still from Amos and Andy. And so these early shows, including The Honeymooners, represented here from 52 to 56, usually portrayed urban working class families facing some of the same everyday problems that we, the audience, faced. And then All in the Family kind of changed that. That ran from 71 to 79 and was something different from the ethnic comedies of the previous decades. Archie Bunker was the model of the unaware bigot prejudiced against Jews, Blacks, foreigners. Um, you should catch an episode of, or two of this. It's really telling. Um, cause at the time, the politically incorrect language was real of, of All in the Family was really shocking on mainstream television. Totally groundbreaking series. But the show is considered right one of the most important comedies of its era because of what it revealed and the subjects that it tackled, like racism, homosexuality, feminism, the Vietnam War, abortion, rape, impotence, cancer, religion, and more than that, right? Our, all in the family helped usher this into um, the national conversation. And furthermore, because the Bunkers had their daughter, Gloria, and her husband, Michael, living with them in the show, it offered a contrast between like the war years generation um, and the baby boomers, right? The hippies and the baby boomers, both of which saw the world from completely different lenses. So this was critical. This really exposed quite a bit about tension in the country at the time. Now we can talk a, a bit about the structure of the self-contained episode as opposed to the series right so the self-contained episode was part of early television series um programming and they were you know half an hour an hour long and they had a beginning a middle and an end type structure to the narrative so the episodes of each program were broken by commercial interruption and um the writers had to make sure that you hung in there so they made cliffhangers, right? So you just couldn't wait to see what happens next. So you sat through the commercials. There was no VC, home VCRs at this time, no um, uh, TiVo at this time, right? You had to sit through those. So each episode though was complete 
in itself. Like there was no background preparation needed. You didn't have, need to um, catch up on the story in any way. You could wa just grab an episode from anywhere and just watch the full program and not have to watch anything else. And until late in the 80s, this was usually the standard for a series, the self-contained episode. You know, and those other ones that we watched as well, or that we just spoke about, like Archie Bunker and The Life of Riley and um, The Honeymooners. You can just watch, you know, Lucy, I Love Lucy. You can w just watch one of those. You don't need a rich background to that. You can just grab one and pretty much know what's going on. Um, in the popular Western series, Bonanza, so this is Bonanza, um, which ran from 59 to 73, the characters generally remained the same and the situations were familiar and appropriate to the locale. And the sense of completion at the end of each episode was kind of satisfying, you know, like it is in most films, self-contained. Twilight Zone was like that, um, The Outer Limits, bunch of them. And more recent crime dramas follow this same pattern, right? And each of these successful series depends on a formula. It's very formulaic. Like, for instance, when Law, Law and Order, which is a, apparently the most successful show of its kind, relies on interpreting versions of recent crimes, like ripped from the headlines. You know, there's a clear-cut division between the police who investigate the crime and the prosecutors who take the case to court, very formulaic. And also CSI in its different iterations, <laughs> there's a bunch of them, usually follows two separate killings in each episode and spends a lot of time in the lab analyzing fingerprints and other forensic details. And that's why there's so many spin-offs of these shows, because it's a formula that has been proven to work. And if you miss one episode, it's not like you'd, you've got a big gap in the narrative because it's self-contained. And so far, these have held the attention of mass audiences. However, the structure, like we've been talking about of these shows, is predictable. Right? And that predictability often um, has limitations as well. People tire of the predictability eventually. But the, again, the, the important thing about the usual series episode on television is that it's self-contained. You don't need preparation in advance and you don't need any explanation. It's considered a one-off, right? What doesn't change are the characters, the locale, and the time when the program airs. So the structure of the serial episodes different. So one type of program with which commercial television has set itself apart from the standard production film is the serial. So where the standard production film is about 120 minutes long in two hours, a television serial production can be open-ended, just keeps going and going and going. So soap operas are broadcast at the same hour each weekday. Perfect example. Viewers can begin with any episode and be entertained, but um, each episode only has a minor resolution. You got to kind of hang in there episode after episode to get to know the characters and to follow the story as it unravels across episodes and seasons and years and decades in the in a lot of the cases. Um, early television soap operas like Another World, The Secret Storm, and Search for Tomorrow were continuing stories that focused on personal problems that involved like money, sex, and questionable moral behavior in settings that reflected the communities of the time. And in Spanish language programming, telenovelas do the same. So the structure of the soap opera contributed to television's development of the distinctive serial structure that remains one of the greatest strengths of this medium. And also pop culture professor Robert J. Thompson has said, the series is indeed 
broadcasting's unique aesthetic contribution to Western art. So let's talk a bit about TV and values. Since its inception as an important and integral part of American life in the 1950s, TV, just like cinema, has both reflected and nurtured, created cultural mores and values. So from the escapist dramas of the 1960s, which consciously avoided controversial issues and glossed over life's harsher realities, in favor of some idealized portrayal to the copious reality TV shows in recent years, um, on which participants discuss even the most personal and taboo issues, TV has held up a mirror to society in one way or another. But the relationship between social attitudes and TV is reciprocal, right? Like the dog chasing its tail. Um, broadcasters have often demonstrated their power to influence viewers either consciously through like slanted political commentary or just subtly by portraying controversial relationships like single parenthood, same-sex marriages, or interracial couplings, right? These are portrayed as socially acceptable and it influences us. So the symbiotic nature of TV and culture is exemplified in every broadcast from family sitcoms to serious news reports. You can see how the show reflects the society and creates societal values all at the same time. So let's take a quick tour. This is kind of cool. So of how TV reflected values in the 1950s. So in the 50s, most TV programs ignored current events and political issues. Um, and instead, the three big networks developed these primetime shows that would appeal to the most general family audience. And most important of these types of shows was the domestic comedy, which is a generic family comedy that was identified by its character-based humor and usually set within the home. And some really important examples included um, uh, Leave it to Beaver and uh, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet and The Donna Reed Show, right? So domestic comedies presented this standardized version of white middle-class suburban family and also the conservative values of an idealized American life. These shows, like we mentioned, really carefully avoided critical social issues. They were very much out not to make any waves or not to create any controversy. They wanted to most white bread, most uh, common denominator audience they could possibly pitch to, they did. So they avoided racial, you know, issues like racial discrimination and civil rights. And instead they focused on mostly white middle-class families with traditional nuclear roles, like mother in the home, father in the office, coming home, family dinner. So this had um, a tendency to imply that most domestic problems could be solved within a 30-minute time slot, always ending with a strong moral lesson. So these shows reflected values from the 50s, but then at the same time also kind of created ex, you know, false expectations on the on behalf of American families. Like, hey, right, mom's making dinner, dad's coming home, got a problem in the home, we can all sit around the table, work it out, resolve it, boom, 30 minutes and it's over, right? That's not how life was, not then and not now. So then in the 60s, um, you know, there was some intense stress, stress faced by many Americans that were, most of us are aware of, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the assassinations of JFK, RFK, and MLK, the Civil Rights Crisis, uh, Vietnam. So broadcasters and viewers turned to escapist programs 
Like they wanted to get away from this kind of all this stress. So they looked to programs like I Dream of Genie, which is a fantasy show or was a fantasy fantasy show about a two thousand year old genie who marries an astronaut. And so that's uh, here and Bewitched, right? A supernatural theme show about a witch who tries to live as a suburban housewife. And other popular sitcoms in the '60s were escapist in nature as well like the Beverly Hillbillies about a poor backwoods family who moved to Beverly Hills after striking oil on their land. And Gilligan's Island, which was the ultimate escapist comedy, right? seven characters shipwrecked on an uncharted island. So ultimately none of the 60s sitcoms mentioned, or excuse me, none of them mentioned any of the political unease that was taking place in the outside world. And this gave audiences, you know, a diversion from real life, a place to escape where they didn't have to, uh, where the audiences didn't have to think about the, this, these terrible goings on of the 60s and just relieve a little stress. So then in the 70s, broadcasters began to like diversify families on their shows to reflect changing social attitudes toward formally controversial issues like, for instance, single parenthood and divorce. And feminist groups like um, NOW and the National Women's Political Caucus and the Coalition of Labor Union Women push for equality on issues like pay and encourage women to enter the workforce. And then in 72, the U.S. Supreme Court sanctioned women's right to abortion, giving them control over their reproductive rights. Now, divorce rates also skyrocketed during the 70s as states started to adopt no-fault divorce laws. And the change in family dynamics was reflected on television. So, for instance, Maud. Right between seventy two and seventy eight, CBS aired this really controversial sitcom named Maude, which featured a middle aged feminist living with her fourth husband and divorced daughter. And the show exploded the dominant values of the white middle class domestic sitcom, along with its traditional gender roles. Like Maude, throughout its seven year run, tackled issues like abortion, menopause, birth control, alcohol, alcoholism, and depression, another really controversial show. And then also from the 70s, um, we had Mary Tyler Moore show, which reflected changing attitudes towards women's rights by featuring television's first never married independent career woman as the central character, Mary Tyler Moore. Um, you know, the Brady Bunch had a non-nuclear family, a blended family, um, which reflected the reality of blended families in that time. And, you know, the Partridge family featured a widow woman raising five children. Then in the 80s, or up until the 80s, the top three networks, the big three, had dominated TV broadcasting in the U.S. But then as cable services started gaining popularity after deregulation in 1984, we all of a sudden had a multitude of options. I remember when this happened, right? CNN, MTV, HBO all just exploded. And, um, you know, ESPN profoundly altered the television landscape in the world of news, sports, and music. All of a sudden, all of these channels, all of these options, and things running, um, you know, 24-hour news cycle, 24-hour entertainment cycle. So, new markets opened up for these innovative program types, as well as for older genres like the sitcom, but the, you know the the uh, networks, the big three, 
responded in kind and revived the family sitcom with two huge hits, were, which were The Cosby Show and Family Ties. And both of these featured a new take on modern family life. You know, the mother is working outside the home and the father's pitching in with housework and parental duties. But um, despite their success on network TV, sitcoms still face stiff competition from cable's variety of choices. Big shakeup during the 80s. Then in the 90s and 2000s, um, you know, newer content delivery platforms started to stretch out um, audiences and compete for market share. So you got more TV viewership, but spread more thinly because we have so many options. And in recent years, broadcasters have been narrowing the focus of their program to meet the needs and interests of an increasingly fragmented audience trying to capture market share. So now we have like entire cable channels devoted to like cooking, music, news, African-American interests, uh, weather, courtroom drama, right? So we can choose exactly what kind of niche program we want to watch. You all know this. And many news channels are further specialized according to viewers' political opinions. So we got a trend towards specialization here that reflects a more general shift within society. As these companies, commercial companies, cater increasingly to smaller, more targeted consumer bases. And business magazine editor Chris Anderson explains, we're leaving the water cooler era when most of us listened, watched, and read from the same relatively small pool of mostly hit content. And we're entering the microcultural era when we are all into different things. So just as cable broadcasters are cater catering to niche markets, Internet-based companies like Amazon and Netflix are taking advantage of this concept by selling large numbers of books, DVDs, music albums, all of this with n narrow appeal. We're all familiar with this stuff today. And despite entering a microculture era with a variety of niche markets, television remains the most important unifying cultural presence in the U.S. And during times of national crises, TV news broadcasts have been galvanized the country by providing real-time coverage of major events, like you know when the terrorists crashed planes into the World Trade uh, Center towers in 2001. The 24-hour news cycle was right there along with it. There's so many other examples of this, you know, school shootings and in war, right? Um, meanwhile, network blockbusters like Lost and 24 have kind of united viewers in the kind of sharing anticipation and it launched a bunch of blogs, fan sites, um, speculative workplace discussions about characters' fates, you know, so like, like Lost, 24, um, Walking Dead, um, Game of Thrones, you name it. But during the past um, few decades, mass media news coverage has gone beyond swaying public opinion through mere imagery. So there were trusted centrist voices like Walter Cronkite at CBS. He was known for his impartial reporting of some of the biggest news stories in the 60s. And today, you know, um, voices like Walter Cronkite's have been replaced by these highly politicized news coverage um, shows on cable, like, you know, Fox News and Tucker Carlson and um, uh, MSNBC, like Rachel Maddow. So as broadcasters narrow their focus to, carry to um, cater to more specialized audiences, viewers choose to watch the networks that suit their political biases. 
and um, middle of the road network CNN, which kind of aims for nonpartisanship, frequently, you know, some argue that it doesn't achieve it, frequently loses out in the ratings war against Fox and MSNBC, both of which have fierce groups of, you know, more um, politicized supporters. And critics argue that partisan news networks cause viewers to have less understanding of opposing political opinions. And this is part of what makes us more polarized. And if you're either listening to far left news or just leftist news or right wing news that are catering to those attitudes specifically, you're much less likely to hear the middle ground. And this kind of is how, um, you know, it's argued that this helps create the polarity that we're experiencing at this very moment. So TV and social controversy, the issue of whether television producers have some kind of responsibility to promote particular social values still to this day continues to generate heated discussion. So it's interesting when um, the unmarried title character in Murphy Brown back in the 90s um, got pregnant and chose to have her baby without any involvement from the father. Then President Dan Quayle referenced the show as an example of degenerating family values. And he linked it to the 92 Los Angeles riots as well. And he said, it doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown, a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. This was a big deal in the news back then. And similar controversy arose with um, portraying openly gay characters on primetime TV shows, like when Ellen came out in 97 on her show, um, she became the first leading gay character on both broadcast and cable networks. And it kind of showed to be a test case for the nation's tolerance of openly gay characters on primetime TV. Lots of debate there. Um, you know, Jerry Falwell, that televangelist, uh, famously called her Ellen Degenerate, right? This was another real big deal in the 90s. Then reality TV. So reality TV uh, is thought, reality TV is thought to first started with Candid Camera back in the late 40s, right? It's like practical jokes um, and eventually developed into like, America's Funniest Home Videos, America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, and then all toward uh, near the end of the millennium, then we have started getting these voyeuristic shows like um, the, the original MTV, The Real World, which was a, you know, documentary that followed the lives of seven strangers who lived together in a big house, right? That show got a lot of criticism for glamorizing, for being voyeuristic, really, for glamorizing bad behavior and encouraging excessive drinking, casual sex, but the ratings soared. And, you know, then we had a whole bunch of others coming, copycat reality TV shows like uh, Big Brother, um, you know, Survivor, right? Um, what else? Are there? The Bachelor, the Bachelorette, and all of its iterations, Temptation Island, you, you know, here's the original real world again. Um, you know, these things are cheap to produce. They have a never ending supply of people who are clamoring to get on these shows, right? They barely have to pay them anything bunch of advertising dollars because of how popular the shows are, how much we like to watch this stuff, right? They continue to be, bring in huge ratings. And 
let's, you know, not to mention the creation of celebrities through reality television. I could have done this whole lecture on just this phenomenon, right? But it's something to think about. People who have gotten incredibly famous through quote unquote reality television. And some of them gone on to build empires or, or, you know, more, you know, or careers in music, or careers in fashion or careers in television or makeup, whatever the case, right? You know, Paris Hilton, Nicole Richie, Lauren um, Conrad, Jennifer Hudson, um, Kristen Cavallari, Cardi B, Lala Anthony, of course, the whole Kardashian clan. Incredible. So, in this video, we covered a lot of stuff. We covered the evolution of TV, subject matter of TV, commercial TV, including the self-contained episode and the serial, some examples. We just talked about TV and values, how they're created and reflected, um, and some a little bit about reality TV and its relationship to this, uh, you know, the celebrity industrial machine. <laughs>